Great. Thank you so much. And thank you for this opportunity to participate in the workshop. Um, I'm very happy to be able to talk openly about some of the mathematics behind what we do and uh, not have to sugarcoat it too much. Um, I am going to show a number of examples of the work that we're doing and how that intersects with the um, the focus of the workshop on um, networks of autonomous vehicles with the human interactions. Um, this slide here shows some of the kinds of systems that we work on in my research group. Um, so you can see a couple of examples of kind of the classical network models, as well as um, uh, some of the bio-inspired and biological systems that I work on. And I'll be talking about um, how sensing um, and observability tie together to give us um, or to help support getting some of the results that we would like out of these multi-agent systems. And so I think this is actually a, a good placement for my talk relative to the others because we had modeling, we had some control, we had some um, other kinds of sensing things. And so the, the work that I'll talk about here will be some of the mathematical tools that we can use to um, assess and then improve the sensing capabilities of our systems. Okay, so um, my lab at the University of Washington uh, is the Nonlinear Dynamics and Control Lab. And sort of broadly speaking, the things that we address in my lab are autonomous vehicles, underwater, ground, air, some space applications, um, bio-inspired systems. So I do quite a bit of collaborative work with um, people in biology and computer science who work with biological and bio-inspired systems. We do a lot of um, shape actuated dynamics. I won't be talking about that particularly today, but really more about this integration of sensing and actuation. So there's a bunch of benefits that we can get um, from looking at this coupling between how things move and how they sense. Um, and then the diagram here on the right is, I think, a good framework to, to think about in terms of what I'll talk about uh, with our tools today. So you can really generalize the, the network kind of modality and the graph theoretic structure to cover a variety of things. And so what I've done here was I just put some little icons that I thought were maybe appropriate for um, this particular audience in terms of the nodes could be people that are standing in place um, or moving around, you've got vehicles in the system and you want to be able to um, guarantee that you're gonna get particular information or that you will know the quality of the information that's going on for a variety of reasons. And so um, also some of the key contributors for the work today are some of my my former students, Nathan Powell, Atia Aladini, uh, Trevor Avant and Brian Hinson. And so the publications with all of them will be at the bottom of the pages. Okay, so here's one of my favorite videos from some work I um, led. Um, it was a Muri from the Office of Naval Research. And this is a bunch of bats in their evening, evening excursion to go get food. And this is in Texas and this happens every night. Um, and tourists and I think some of the local people come every night and, and check out the bats. And like, you know, the one guy stuck his arm out. And the key thing um, relative to this um, video that I want to uh, have people do as a takeaway is that these bats are doing things that we cannot do with engineered systems yet. These, this is literally thousands of bats coming out of this small opening. And then, you know, later in the day, they'll reverse this and fly back in. And then when they come out, they don't hit the guy in the arm. Like, and they have, they may know at this point that like, you know, there's often some people over there, but they still don't know when somebody's going to do something unexpected and, you know, stick a large object out into the the, the bats as they're flying around. So it's something that we'd like to be able to um, achieve with engineered systems. Okay, so here's another application. So this is one, um, I'll turn on just a second here, but kind of the, the framework here to keep in mind is um, many of the kinds of applications we're looking at with autonomous vehicles um, involve observers trying to figure out what's going on with objects moving around in a space. And so this is an example of that where um, I'm not going to show too many of the results of this, but what we're looking at doing here is how do you get object pose, position and orientation, just from visual data. And lots of people are doing this. And um, kind of the, the piece that I want to focus on here is how do we do this in a very cluttered environment where we have sensing issues? And how do you, how do you assess that you have sensing issues and what do you do about that? And so here's kind of the framework, and I apologize if it gets a little loud. I didn't hook the video, the audio in, but um, it's, it's a quad rotor in a small space, so it, it gets loud. Um, and so what's going on here is it's being told to go to particular locations 
And um, when it flies, of course, in front of these cabinets down here, it's a black object in front of a black cabinet. And the, um, the framework that I'm gonna kind of put this in terms of will be observability. So are you even really mathematically going to be able to solve that problem in that particular context, or are you going to need to do something different? Okay, so um, here's the kind of classic block diagram representation of what we're doing with a, a control system. So we have whatever it is that we want the system to do or whatever it is it wants to do uh, relative to what um, we know is going on with the system. So there's a desired state and then the estimated state. I'm gonna work my way around this way and then we'll come back to that estimated state. You define your controller based on your error. There are gonna be disturbances that come into the system from the environment. Um, there's always going to be some uncertainty in what you know about the model and the dynamics. Then once um, the system is doing something or even you know, it's sitting there, there's gonna be some noise that comes in through your sensors. And from the measurements um, that you get from your sensors, you then need to use an estimator and a filter or filter either way um to come up with an estimated state and a key thing about our estimated state is that error covariance down there that sigma that sigma tells us how well do we know or do we think we know the state of the system that we have produced out of our estimator and um what are we going to do about that okay so key thing here robustness what we really want to be able to do is guarantee that even if you're in the presence of a bunch of disturbances or uncertainty or noise that you're still going to get the desired behavior out of the system without you know things coming entirely unhinged so what the focus has typically been um, around robustness is looking at the controller design as a function of that uncertainty delta. And so this is kind of the standard model that we see around this is you've got you know, your reference, you've got the, the simpler representation of this loop here with the, the measurements Y and the controller. Um, and then this, the disturbances are up here on the top. And we often talk about them being either additive or multiplicative because we have tools to deal with that. Now, the key thing here is that you can do as much as you can to deal with that uncertainty from a control point of view, but you still have um, some uncertainty or some variability that's going to be coming in from your sensing of your system and from your estimator. And the, the kinds of things I'll talk about here in terms of tools uh, in the next little bit are uh, independent or agnostic to the type of estimator or filter that you're using. So what's going on in any of these estimators and filters is you've got this set of measurements that are coming in. In general, one assumes that you're given the error code or not the error, the covariance of your noise terms, both the disturbances and, and the noise that you're given that. And so that's a whole separate thing I'm not going to talk about here, but that is something that my group works on is how do you determine that. But you feed this into your system and then most um, estimators and filters have a representation of the model and the um, sensor measurement process that they represent. And then there's, um, of course, the controllers are something we choose, so we know what that is. But so there's this representation of the model. And then what comes out of your estimator is the system's best guess at what's going on with the current states and then that error covariance. And so regardless of what you do with the controls, if you don't do something to address um, how well can you tighten up that error covariance, because really we want it to be really tight and really peaky, um, you're going to be completely constrained in terms of robustness by that error covariance. And so that's something, um, it turns out we can do some things about that. And so that's what I'm going to go into here, some of the tools around that that we've been working on in my group. Okay, so key bit, this is a little bit of um, spoiler here. So I'm going to put this result here and then I'll walk through um, what we can do with it. Um, so the sigma inverse, that's just the inverse of the error covariance, um, that is bounded by the Fisher information matrix. So that's a, a key thing you can get out of a system. It's a, um, a calculation determined by noise as well as, as it turns out, the observability of the system. And so what I've got here on the, the very right bound here, so this um, Fisher information matrix provide is bounded by the minimum singular value of your uh, noise term, as one would expect, um, but also a function of um, what I'll walk through here, which is the observability gramian, which is a measure of how observable are the things that you're trying to assess in your system. And so that provides a bound. And the, the smaller that bound is, 
the worse off you're going to be. And so we really want to, to be able to um, do what we can to um, adjust this bound. Okay, so one of the places it turns out that we can do this is by not using the separation principle. So for people who are familiar um, with linear systems, kind of one of the key features about them is that um, the sensing and the actual the sensing and the actuation are separate. So how you control the system doesn't affect how the sensing works. But it turns out that in biological systems like bats, as well as these other ones that I'm showing here, um, how the system is moving is actually being used to augment the sensing capabilities. And so this is what's referred to as active sensing. And so this is something um, that um, we all use in all of our lives. And we just, I think, really don't think about it. Um, and it turns out we can do some things to leverage this to improve sensing. Okay, so this is an example of this where it's actually been used in autonomous vehicles without really kind of knowing what was going on. So this is back in the 90s. This was the first vehicle, autonomous vehicle to fly across the Atlantic. So this is the Aerosond. Um, and it had really limited sensors on board and pretty limited computation. It ran on about a, a lawnmower's worth of gasoline to go completely across um, from Newfoundland over to Scotland. And it did this um, with no communication. So really, really limited sensing and actuation, which is something that um, there are a number of autonomous vehicle kinds of applications where um, you just don't have oodles of computation and um, sensing capabilities. So what it had on board was it had um, differential GPS um, and um, airspeed from a pitot probe but it did not have direct estimation of the wind speed. So it couldn't um, directly calculate what the wind speed was and, and, and compensate for that by using onboard sensing. So what it did was it used the GPS, the differential GPS and some S turns to figure out what was, what was happening as it was flying and then correct for the issue. Now it turns out there's, that's completely supported by the mathematics that I'm going to show here in a minute about how sensing and actuation are coupled together and some things we can do to leverage that. So I just like this example because it's it's one where we can actually do the math pretty straightforward. Okay, so so the key bit that I'm going to talk about here, and this is just an informal definition of, of the, the property, is observability. So you're given a set of measurements over some finite time interval, and you want to know, can you... Um, reconstruct the quantities of interest. And so this is the forward loop is the measurements y are equal to some function of your states and your controls. And I'm specifically uh, showing this as a nonlinear function and it's sort of done in continuous state and time here. Well, actually the, the, um, the various terms here are shown in discrete time, the u sub k and the x sub k. That's irrelevant. It, the key thing is that um, you've got this loop process. You can do it either way. And what we want to do with observability is figure out, is it possible to invert this relationship? And sometimes you can only do that locally, which is often the case in nonlinear systems. OK, so here's some of the underlying mathematics for this from the linear point of view, because I think this is what probably most people are familiar with, and it's a good foundation point. So just showing it in continuous time, because it's a little bit easier here. So you have your measurement, y equals cx, and the x here in the, in the equation is what we're aiming to collect. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to take some time derivatives of our measurement. So assume that you can do that. This is just a mathematical argument. In reality, we don't actually have to rely on that. Do this a few times, and you're going to collect up all the terms. Um, the things in um, on the left-hand side here, these are known, and they're we're assuming they're differentiable, at least um, in a numerical sense. Um, and then the things on the right-hand side here, these are known. So we assume we know the controls because we put them into the system. And we're just going to subtract this off from the left-hand side, so put everything we know on the left-hand side. And then in order to figure out that state x, um, what we need to be able to do is um, have this matrix here, which is referred to as the observability matrix, be full rank so that we can invert some, some um, function of it so that we can extract the X out. Okay, so key thing here is that in the linear systems, the observability doesn't rely on the controls, and that's, that's the separation principle, which is wonderful and, and really helpful when you can use it. Now, in nonlinear systems, and again, the, the representation here is just for ease of the argument, um, a control affine system is just a nice one to write down. So that's one where we've got um, the drift term here. Uh, F naught is something that's independent of the controls. It's just what the system is going to do if you turn off the controls. And then we have some number of controls with their 
associated um, control vector fields here. Um, just keep an eye here. The F naught is our drift. And then this F of X, U, and T is just if you lump the whole thing together, assume you have some controls in there. And our measurement functions are these H's. So do the exact same thing with the linear system. So we're going to take our measurement function and we're going to take a bunch of derivatives. And this is what that looks like. I'm going to shorthand the notation here. If you're familiar with Lie derivatives, that's these are just the same thing as what's in the, the second term here. We're going to call this whole thing g of x and u, which is that same g that was in the previous slide. And if you note here, so these derivatives, the L sub f, this is um, with respect to the full system with the controls in there. In many cases for nonlinear systems, if you turn the controls off, what you get is just the f naught part here. So I've set all the controls to zero. Um, these two things are not the same. And so that's very different from the linear framework. And it turns out that's something we can leverage to um, uh, work with. Okay, so these are important points. Um, and so what we want is, you know, whichever way it is, we want this matrix here to be invertible in the sense of solve it for x um, in order to get observability for the system and be able to reconstruct, reconstruct the states. Now, often we can't do that analytically. And so we do a local a local approximation of it here. And so this is um, the observability rank condition, which people may have seen, um, which basically just says if you do a Jacobian of that function of all the derivatives of the measurements, um, and then just look at that Jacobian, if it's full rank and you can invert it, then that's um, a local um, way of determining whether or not your system is going to be observable. So a number of questions then can be asked around you know, if your system is observable without the controls, that's great, but what if it's not? And then what are some of these characteristics um, that we'd want to put into place either with, you know, how you're actuating an individual system, or if you're looking at more of a, a, a an environmental sampling application where, you, where the sensors are actually moving vehicles, like where should you move them? Um, that uh, is some key questions. So first one's the controls. And then the second one is, where should we put the sensors so that we can improve the observability? Because there's um, some finer points here around like observability often is referred to as a yes or no thing, but there are um, some finer points in there where the properties of that matrix, the observability Gramian is what we'll see it's called here in a minute. Um, if you remember, it bounds the Fisher information matrix and it bounds the um, error covariance for your estimators. And so if you can change the properties and improve them for that observability Gramian, not just an is it invertible or not, but really what are its eigenvalues, singular values, you can do some better things with, with your system performance. Okay, so just to demonstrate this with um, that Arisond example with the actual math behind this. So this is just a simple model of what, um, how that vehicle can operate. And so X, Y, theta, um, position and orientation in the plane, and then the wind direction X and Y. We want to be able to estimate the wind direction from um, the measurements we have. And so assume you've just got GPS measurements here, which is the X and the Y. If you go through the mathematics for this system, it turns out that in order for it to be observable, it does actually have to be moving in not just a straight line. So it does need to be having some heading variations to it. And so if you put in some constant input, so it's not moving around at all, if you note here, um, it cannot lock into both of the wind directions. But if you start putting in motions, and, and this particular example was done with those S turns with the cyclic motions, you can reasonably quickly lock on to both, um, both directions of the wind. So that's a great, um, great capability. Okay, so I'm going to generalize this a little bit, and um, this is where you'll start seeing where some of more of the network kinds of capabilities come in. So think about this one. This is a hawk moth, uh, also one of my favorite things out there. Hawk moths are super cool. They're about yay big. They're super big. Um, and so one of the things that we've looked at is the hawk moths have a lot of strain sensors on the wings. It's about 200 per wing. Um, and so this little blue dots here show where they actually are on the wing. And so this is a great example of a sensor network um, scenario and um, uh, insects and many other creatures don't have a lot of brain power. So they also don't have things like gyroscopes in them. They don't have very complicated sensors. These are strain sensors and we can, you know, build those very easily ourselves. And so one of the questions we were interested in is what can you actually do with these sensors if you kind of leverage these capabilities that I've been talking about? Um, okay, so, so here's a simple model of 
um, the hawk moth and um, what we've got here, what we're interested in, the question is, can you get the body rotation rates out of this system by um, measuring just strain from the, in the wings? And so normally what we would do to get that information is use a gyroscope, but uh, we we're trying to look at, you know, what can insects actually do? Um, so the PQ and R are the body rotation rates, the eta and the eta dot are the mode shapes of the wings. So that's where the sensors are going to go. And so this one is just a simple cantilever model. We've done a variety of other things. Um, and then, so these are the rotation rates and here's just some information down at the bottom about how the, the wings move. So they do a um, feathering motion as the insect flies. And then we assume we know the stiffness matrix, which we do because my biology called colleagues measured it. Um, same thing for the mass information for the system. And then we're going to assume that we have full information about the mode shapes for the system. So just assume we have that, but we don't have direct measurement of the body rotation rates. Okay. So if you do the math on this problem, which is getting somewhat more complex, this is about as complex as we can get um, and still be able to do it analytically. Um, if you turn off the controls in this system and look at that local um, observability result, it turns out the system's not observable, it's only rank four. But if we allow the system to move, which to be honest, it's always doing because it's flapping its wings or it's not flying, um, that flapping motion enables the system to be observable. So we get, this is really kind of what the motion is. This came directly off of observations and measurements of insects flying. And really what this effect is coming from is a leveraging of the Coriolis force in the wing. So as you get this flapping motion and the body's rotating, there's a Coriolis fo force that shows up. And in order to capture it, you need to have that motion. Okay, so some of the challenges here, and then I'll talk about how we get around them. Um, as I mentioned, analyticity of these models, the, the ones I've shown so far are pretty, uh, pretty much the only ones that we, or as far as we can get with analy analytical results that are computationally tractable. Really anything beyond that is um, pretty hard, which is why nonlinear systems are a challenge. Um, also just the, the general complexity of how everything is put together. So there's some things that we can do to work around this um, with respect to observability. So um, what is often done with nonlinear systems, which is how we go back and then use the kinds of estimators that we do is that we linearize them. And so in particular, if we linearize about a nominal trajectory, that's not a constant, not an equilibrium point, but just a, a nominal trajectory, which is what most things are doing, you'll end up with a linear time varying system. And so that's what's shown here. So the X naught and the U naught are the nominal trajectory and you'll get an uh, A, B and C, and sorry, this should have been, there should have been actually an should have been represented a little differently. Sorry about that. Key thing here is the C. Um, so what we can do with this system is um, if you do a calculation here, which is around the output energy, it turns out um, this integral in the middle um, can pull out of this. And this is what's referred to as the observability gramian. And in a linear system, uh, if this matrix is full rank, then the system's observable. There are connections between this matrix and the observability uh, matrix I showed before that we got just by taking derivatives. They give the same uh, information. The nice thing here is though this um, Gramian matrix is um, symmetric. And so there's some good properties that we can leverage off of this. The, the control, it's also square. Um, well. Obviously, it would be if it's symmetric, but um, the controllability matrix doesn't have that property, so it's a little more difficult to work with it directly. And um, and we also know that for um, a nonlinear system, if this linear time varying representation is observable, then the nonlinear system is locally observable, which is which is helpful. Okay. However, still really hard to do the analytical calculations on that, but um, thankfully there was some work done. Uh, in the early 2000s, actually it was done before that. It was done for um, uh, uh, model reduction. So what they were looking, what some people were looking at, Sanjay Lal and colleagues were looking at um, doing model reduction for highly dimensioned systems and then keeping, you know, sort of like an essential piece of it and um, extracting off the rest. Uh, so the tools that were used there were an empirical Gramian, and you can do this both for observability and controllability. So the version I'm gonna show here is just for the observability, but it turns out, that observability Gramian that you get from the linear time varying system, you can construct it just by using simulations. So what you put into the system, into the simulator is the controls and then the initial conditions, you'll get out some trajectory 
Um, and then what you do is you perturb the initial conditions plus or minus epsilon in each of the basis directions, gather up all of the resulting trajectories for the system, and then build them out in this particular way that I show in this equation. And this gives you a, a computational and empirical um, result that has the same information as, as the observability Gramian that you can get analytically. It's just it's a lot easier to construct it. It doesn't rely on um, being able to do any analytical calculations. It doesn't rely on the system having a certain number of derivatives of the outputs, a number of useful features. Okay, so some key results about this. So um, the initial empirical Gramian results assumed that the controls were constant, which as we know for our nonlinear observability, we actually want to be able to um, look at the effects of control variations. So um, one of my students and I generalized things a bit and said, okay, so if there is a control such that um, uh, that epsilon, when it goes to zero, if you limit down there, if there's some time tau greater than zero where the rank of that empirical Gramian is N, then your system's weakly observable at at the initial point. And you do have to kind of keep calculating this. It may actually change over states. So you have to be aware of that. Um, so this is a very helpful thing because it rigorously connects our empirical Gramian to nonlinear observability for systems. Um, it's, it's not the strongest of observability results, but it's definitely a stepping stone, which is great. Um, more helpful, I'm not gonna go through all the math on this slide. Key thing here is this, um, minimum singular value of that empirical Gramian. So if there is some control U where this singular value is greater than a number that I'm not gonna talk through how to calculate it, but as long as that works for some tau that's greater than zero, then you still have that prior result. This is just an easier way of calculating that. So here, what we're looking at is specifically that singular value or the minimum singular value. And so as long as that Gramian is sufficiently positive definite, then we'll have our observability result. Um, it's just, it can be a little difficult to find some of the terms in here, so you have to do it numerically, which is what we do. And then even more helpful, and this is that result that I had shown earlier, is that if you've got a system, it's got measurement noise in there, which if you stop and think about how most observability calculations are done, they assume you, ha they assume you have no noise in your system. It's not explicitly incorporated. But if you do have noise in there, and so you've got your uh, noise covariance are in here. This is how we can bound the Fisher information matrix with this empirical Gramian and information about the noise in the system. So this gives us a really great um, bound on what is going to be possible with the sensor setup that we have for our system. And so you can then go in and start playing with things like um, that, that error covariance on the noise. If that's something that you can fix, you might want to do that. Um, or you can mess with your Gramian here by making particular choices of your sensors and coupling that with the motion of the system. And so that's really kind of what um, we focus on a lot in my group right now. Okay, so how do we do that? So here's the basic nonlinear system I showed before. There's a couple of extra features. Um, so it's control affine system. These are a bunch of sensor functions. And then what we do is we assume in many cases, you don't actually have to do it this way, but it's often what we're looking at in highly complex systems is that um, there's gonna be a limited number of sensors that we can focus on. And so we put switches on all of them. And that's what these little SIs are saying, whether the switches are on or off. And you can um, use these to also distinguish between types of sensors. So that Hawk Moth problem, which I'll go back to in just a second here, we'll actually look at two different types of sensors and whether they're on or off and which one they are. And then we set up an optimization problem. I'm not gonna go too much into the details of how we deal with these optimization problems, but they are um, non-convex as one would sort of expect. So we create a cost function out of the Gramian for the system, the empirical Gramian, and then we do a minimization on uh, a function of that Gramian and then look at it subject to the types of sensors we have and whether they're on or not. Okay, so that's our dynamics, the measurements, the switches, and um, uh, what we do is we have a non-convex problem with constraints, and then we do and have done various things with relaxation or com and or convexification in order to get to something um, that we can apply tools to and then do online learning, nonlinear programs, a bunch of different things. I'll mention one of them when I talk about one of the um, 
a couple of the other applications here. Okay, so back to the Hawk Moth one, just because it's a really good one to see how this all works. So you, what you do, this is this is sort of the representation of the simulations that get put together. And you can do this for any kind of system. You just need to make sure you have all the pieces for your simulation. Um, with, the sin, with the insects, we have um, the wing properties. We actually measure the stroke kinematics from, from live insects. And by we, I mean, actually my biology colleagues, I don't do that. Um, we do build out the, the finite element model of the wings um, to go into the, the model. Um, aerodynamics factor into it, takes a little bit of work. And then you turn the crank, turn it on, and it flies and gathers up your trajectories, and then you perturb the initial conditions. Okay, so what comes out of that for the hawk moth is um, if we look at, say, limit the number of sensors to 20, and again, they have like 200, so it's like 10% of their sensors. We're pretty sure, although we haven't gotten data on this yet, that they're not using all of them all the time. But so just assume that you get 20 of them during this flapping motion and you wanna get body rotation rate. Safe bet that the insects care about that so they don't run into things. Um, and so if you run this algorithm based on the observability and say, where should the sensors be and which type should they be on the wing and then match it. So the little blue boxes are where sensors actually are, the strain sensors actually are in the wings. And then the red and the black are where the algorithm put them. And we allow them to lie, they can only lie on the veins and they can um, be no closer than I forget two millimeters or something is I think what the, the actual physical difference is here. And then say, where do they come out? So if you run this algorithm, this is where they fall out. And so not surprisingly, you get a bunch of bending sensors down at the root of the wing, which is where there's the largest um, bending shear. And then you also get, I'm sorry, bending strain. Uh, and then you get some shear sensors out here on the tip, which is where you're gonna get more of the torsion in the wing showing up. And um, you can keep on doing this for any number of sensors. We just let it run for a while to see how many showed up. And so you'll see, uh, at least for this particular application, the sensors tend to break out into different sections, which is kind of interesting. And this is something we're still looking at as to why that is and, and how that um, compares with what's going on in the actual insects. And then we've also compared this across a bunch of insects. Um, so you can see, depending on how the dynamics of the, the system vary, um, you'll get slightly different results, but I'll, I think it's actually pretty interesting how some similarities show across a lot of time and space spatial scales in insects. Because a hawk moth, again, is about yay big. His wings are pretty hefty. Um, a honeybee is not so big. And then Drosophila, a fruit fly, is super small. Um, but there's definitely, and this is um, this variation here is we use different FEA models um, for the wings. So there's some, some interesting things that come out of leveraging this tool. Um, some of our recent results, which I haven't put in here, actually we're looking at using sensing functions that come off of uh, neurological models um, for um, uh, neuron spiking in uh, biological systems and how that affects the um, sensing results here. Okay, so now taking this a little bit more toward um, where uh, autonomous vehicles and that interaction of autonomous vehicles and human operators comes up. I'm going to show a couple of network observability results of what you can do with this and then say a bit more about how you can take this forward. Um, so same kind of setup as the um, problem I discussed before. So this is our representation of the dynamics of a number of agents. And so these um, are moving around. And then um, if you're going to be doing things like an environmental sampling kind of task, the environment dynamics would need to factor in here. So we're doing some of that with um, like underwater sensing right now. Um, and then you've got the controls, which will be um, how are the, the agents going to move around? And then you've got whatever it is you're going to sense. And so this one's very simple one. We're just sensing position of each of the agents. And um, in this case, we'll just say that the sensors can be on or off. Um, this is helpful when you have like a large network and like if it is something where you're doing like an, an ocean um, sensing platform, um, one of the ways that those um, platforms are most efficient is that often the sensors are off. And so you only turn them on at particular times for particular reasons um, to capture essential information. Then you turn it back off so that the, the battery life of the system can, can make it for several months. Um, okay, so uh, here's what our measurement model looks like. So these switches, again, um, you take all of the sensors, there's a switch on each one, and so the total measurement is all of the ones, all of the sensors and whether or not they're on or off. So this get big long vector of those. 
And um, here's a little bit about one of the ways that we've done some of the solutions. I, I left this in as a, a token. Um, so you do get these um, mixed integer linear programs um, that you can uh, uh, exploit with the nonlinear program solvers um, to do some iterative approaches to solving them. These run reasonably fast. They are not real time. Um, so that is something that we are looking at, which is how can you get um, this whole system to operate in real time? And then here's the framework for the optimization problem here on the right. Um, so this is the cost function here. Uh, so this is a function. So it turns out you can, uh, when you when you put these switches in, you can actually break out um, the observability gradient into some sort of basis pieces and then simplify some of the math. Okay, so if we go through and solve that, um, here is an application of that particular framework. This is for a virus spreading model. So we got interested in this back when um, Ebola was going around, but now it seems a little more useful for other reasons. Um, so this is a very simple process here. It's based on um, probabilities of infection and curing, or at least of um, healing and then being immune. So this is a very, very simple model of um, virus spreading. Um, there are much more complex ones that are used um, in other kinds of, in actual pandemic situations. So here we've just got um, probabilities of the different um, situations and you can do this for however many nodes you want. And this is a way that you can boil down those probabilities into a state space model. And then the key thing here um, is, so we've got, um, our state is X, which is the, the probability of infection for each of the nodes of the system. Work all this out. And then the question is, if you have a situation like this, and really what we were interested in was if you've got, um, you know, like a, a bunch of villages and you want to know which ones should you go and test at to have a good idea of the spread of a virus, um, which one should it be if you have a limited ability to get there? And definitely like in Africa, that's that's a challenge to get out there. So, so looking at that structuring, and so let me just go back here for a second, but so down here, so this is showing what is the connect, or these two pieces here are showing the connectivity between the different nodes and how are they um, interacting. And so if you have a sparse structure, um, it might be that you need to do sensing at these two nodes and this the lines here represent um, interactions between the nodes. So like people moving back and forth between villages. If you have a much denser structure, it turns out you actually need fewer points to, to measure in this particular setup. Um, just depends on the structure. We don't have anything um, further yet on um, some guarantees on what kind of structures you need or want to prevent in order to um, know what's going on and in fact prevent disease spread. Okay, now we can flip this and um, and say instead of um, trying to know what's going on everywhere in a network, if we want to prevent information from flowing, which is actually a, a situation if you've got um, uh, you know a network of vehicles and um, human interaction human interaction with them, you want to protect the information in the system so that it can't be messed with. Um, we can flip this whole problem and what we want to do now is we want to minimize the observability or figure out what can we do with the topology to do that and so this is a reverse on that uh, reverse on the um, guaranteeing observability and so here if we've got our network of agents and we want to know um, where if we know that someone might be looking at a particular node and trying to figure out what's going on everywhere what can we do with these communication pathways in order to prevent um, a full set of knowledge about the system so what we're going to do here now is we're going to minimize the trace of our observability gradient, and what's going to end up happening is we'll get these um, different weightings on the the pathways between the agents. So here's a framework for that. Um, and so I apologize. I realized this morning that I'm using little w's for the weightings and um, the capital W is the gradient. So that might get a little confusing there. But so here's a Here's a representation of the trace of the Gramian in terms of the weights. So A is a function of the weights. And then we've got this optimization problem that we want to solve, assuming that the weights are all positive, that none of them are zero, um, although you can work that in. Okay, so here's um, some bounds on that. I'm gonna kind of skim over this in interest of time. And um, so here's a result of what it looks like um, in operation. So if we start off with this network over here and assume that somebody is starting off by um, 
measuring or monitoring at these three nodes here, and these are all the weights between the nodes, um, what should we do? And it does assume that we know that there are people monitoring, which of course is another sensing problem. Um, and so what starts to happen is that as time goes by and the system is working on changing these weights, so they are effectively the controls in the system, They some of these um, pathways start getting stronger and some of them start getting weaker as we try and prevent information getting from the full network to these particular nodes. And so we get to out to here to this point and then the nodes switch as to which ones are being monitored. This one is consistent, but then these two are, are being monitored and then we continue on. And so the system can be um, handled dynamically and that um, is a way of helping to prevent information flow. Okay, so some of the things that we're still, or some of the things we have done with this, we've looked at um, doing um, applications with sensing vorticity in a, a flow behind an airfoil, or you can do this um, in water, of course, uh, looking at um, sensors on bat wings. Sensors, um, bat wings are super cool. They have like about a bajillion um, no joke, totally measured, uh, hair cells, little hair cells on them. And, um, they, uh, have the ability in bat wings, the, the muscle fibers are not necessarily attached to structural components. And so that membrane in the bat wing is actually very dynamically activated. And so there's a really cool interaction between the sensing and, um, the dynamics of the wing. It's, um, something we're still working on. So that's a, a combination here. Um, another thing we've looked at is how do you do optimal um, uh, path planning, trying to, in order to make sure you have the most information of a system. So this is my water tank where uh, my underwater vehicles run around. Um, and so if you do a ranging beacon situation, which is a fairly typical um, thing for underwater systems, it turns out, um, not surprisingly, you don't wanna follow a straight line because that um, doesn't give you the best information. So this was a, um, a trajectory planning algorithm based on um, jointly optimizing the information about position. Um, and I think I took out actually the, uh, the physical results we have on this one. Um, and then we also look at um, things with um, uh, like schools of fish, flocks of birds, those kinds of applications. And then one of the things that we've been working on um, over a number of years, and we're um, working on it more consistently right at the moment is around stochastic systems. So you can um, extract out the same kinds of information for stochastic systems as for um, deterministic. And as I'd mentioned before, we often, when we talk about observability and all the tools for such things, um, say, uh, we don't um, generally, we haven't built such tools to explicitly allow for noise and disturbances in the system and talk about observability in that framework. Um, what this will allow us to do by taking that directly into consideration is um, actually move to a point where um, those uh, two end trajectories that we need to generate in order to get our observability empirically, we'll actually be able to start swapping in physical trajectories where we can't guarantee that the initial conditions are exactly what we needed to guarantee the result. And so you end up getting um, the result in terms of probability density functions of the, um, the dynamics of the system. Okay, and... Um, we put up my my slide here thanking all of my funding agencies that have contributed over the time that we've worked on this um right now it's primarily funded um not out of not of a miri but well not out of this miri there's some ongoing work with um, um some other um, air force and onr grants that wasn't specifically represented here and then all of the information including publications can be found on our lab website so i will end there and I'm happy to take questions from anybody.